Okay, we're going to get started now. We have a great day planned for you. You're going to hear from Apple Shops Media Institute today, as well as from award-winning storyteller and brilliant educator, Adam Booth. Um, you're going to eat a good lunch. You're going to spark some ideas. Um, you'll meet people. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce to you to your keynote speaker. Named a Rotary Peace Champion at the United Nations last year, President of the International Storytelling Center, my friend and colleague, Kieran Singh Sarah. Hey. <laughs> I got this microphone. Thank you. Let me put this here. If I can. Oh, buenos dias. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as a, a new Appalachian with a bit of Indian descent, I'd like to welcome you all with a namaste, y'all. <laughs> That's my favorite. So I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to welcome you all. And I'd like to start, really, with a quick show of hands. How many of you consider yourselves to be storytellers? About half the room. OK, well, in my line of work, and as president of the International Storytelling Center, I'd say you're all storytellers. Or at least we all have the potential to be. And why? Because to tell a story is a universal human right. It's one of the greatest universal cultural expressions and by its very nature, a truly democratic art form. It's also one of the greatest gifts that we can use to not only enrich the lives, our lives, but also the lives of others. And something we can use to heal, to come together, to change the world. And this is, in fact, what the mission is here at the International Storytelling Center and why we're here today as part of our first ever inaugural Youth Summit. So as we explore this today, I'd like to start by honoring and offering respect, firstly, to the indigenous peoples of this land, the land of the Cherokee, and all across this nation that have helped to preserve the traditions for thousands of years, these traditions of storytelling, to our ancestors and the stories of those that came before us that shaped our identities. After all, stories is part of our DNA. We are all storytellers, disciples of tradition, past and present, hot-blooded believers in the promises of what storytelling can bring. We are citizens, resident aliens, new migrants, immigrants, and dreamers. We are artists of the world, and we are the poets of our communities. We are all advocates of culture, or at least as we learn to listen and collaborate, share our stories with each other. And in the tradition of the Iroquois and many of the native traditions of this land, may the learning and collaboration the seeds that we sow today help generations in seven generations to come. All of us have the ability to write our own storied script, and we all have the power to shape the story of the world around us that we wish to see, a world without conflict. My name is Kieran Singh, and I'm the president of the International Storytelling Center based right here in Jonesboro in the mountains of Tennessee. Now, as you can tell by my accent, I'm not actually originally from Tennessee. I'm a newly adopted Tennessean, and before that, a Rotary Peace Fellow based in North Carolina. Before that, an adopted new Scot that lived and worked and made Scotland my home. Before that, an English-born Sikh of British, Asian, Indian, and African descent, descended from Kampala and Tororo in Uganda, Mombasa, Kenya, and the villages of Hisharpororki and Babasang Santesia in Punjab in northern India. Now, if you're confused, try celebrating Christmas, Pesach, Eid, or Diwali at my house. <laughs> I think a lot about story. I think a lot about storytelling and story listening and why it's important. And I've come to believe that the most powerful force in this universe is the power of thought. But the most powerful means to communicate that thought is story. And one of the questions I often get asked is, when did this storytelling thing begin? And very often, especially as storytellers, we imagine, we see this image of the hunter-gatherers or our traditional teachers gather around, gathered around a campfire telling stories. But I believe it started before then. It even started before we could pick up colored rocks and etched visual pictographs onto cave walls. It started when we could look up into the sky, we saw the stars, and we began to use our imagination. So as we think about that, the imagination and the power of story, 
And as I hope you are doing right now, is relating these moments and events and connections that you have to this art form that we call storytelling. So let me offer you now a background to my story, or at least the version I'm willing to tell you today. <laughs> I've been with the International Storytelling Center since 2013, but my organization began over 40 years ago when a local high school teacher called Jimmy Neal Smith decided he wanted to save this dying mountain town by creating an annual storytelling event he boldly called the National Storytelling Festival. Now, that was a pretty fancy name for something that was literally 60 people gathered around the wagon. But there was enough magic there to spark a movement and something that my predecessor liked to call a storytelling revolution. A storytelling revolution. It kind of has a ring to it, doesn't it? Well, around the same time, there were less quaint revolutions happening in other parts of the world, and one of them involved my own family. My family lived in Uganda, in East Africa, and in the summer of 1972, four years before I was born, there was an announcement on Ugandan public radio by the then dictator Idi Amin. And he declared that all Ugandan Asians had three months to leave the country, or they'd all be executed. That meant around 50,000 people, including my own family, had three months to flee the country. My family fled the border. They left for Britain. They couldn't carry much, but what they could carry was taken from them by robbers on their route to the airport. Having left behind all their personal possessions and the tropical heat of East Africa, they arrived in a small English town called Eastbourne in the middle of the British winter. And this is where I was born. As Ugandan refugees, as Sikhs, my parents stood out in my small hometown. My father wore a bright red turban and a colorful African shirt, and my mother an even brighter red sari. Later, my dad told me about overhearing this kid tell her mom, after seeing my dad, look, mom, aliens, meaning the kind of the aliens from outer space. And my dad still loves to tell that story. Now, for the most part, the vast majority of people were incredibly kind and welcoming to my family. But there were some that weren't so. As an immigrant family, and as I, as the first person of color born in my hometown, there was racism in our small community. But as a kid, that's not how you thought about it. I just knew it was hard to understand why I felt so different. Home was always a safe space. But whenever I had to leave the house, I felt like I had to be constantly on my guard. It was hard to concentrate in school, and sometimes I was the one that ended up causing trouble instead. But things started to change for me when my head teacher in our weekly school assembly started to tell stories. Mr. George, he was an older man. He was white, pretty much like everybody else around me. But he wore this tweed jacket and this kind face, and he told us folk tales and traditional stories from all over the world. And one of them really spoke to me. It was about a prince that gives up his worldly riches and goes out into the world to explore the world, but he takes two objects with him, a cup, and a toothbrush. And one day he looks out and he sees someone break a twig from a tree to chew the twig that would release these juices that would clean his teeth. And he realized he didn't need his toothbrush anymore, so he threw it away. Another day he sees someone bent double beside the river, cupping their hands together in the shape of a bowl to drink the water from the river. And he realized he didn't need his cup anymore, so he threw that away, realizing he didn't need that either. Listening to that story, I began to observe the world in a different way. Not only did that story paint a picture of a world beyond what I already knew or understood around me, but it connected me to the idea that perhaps the world provides all the things that we need to live in it. That story turned my fear to hope, and it made me see the possibilities where before I'd seen the challenges, and it helped me see my own family's difficult situation, my parents showing up in an unfamiliar country with nothing but the clothes on their back in a new way. They didn't need material things to connect to new people or have new experiences or to remember the old ones. I began to see myself, the world, and my place in that world. And I started to see the outlines of the story that I wanted to see in the world and how I could make that happen. Hearing that folktale, it felt like Mr. George was speaking directly to me. But I expect he was speaking to everybody else in different situations. But that's the magic of a good story. I was around nine years old at the time of Mr. George storytelling. And his story certainly helped me navigate a sense of a dual identity at that time, being born and raised in Britain with family from elsewhere. It allowed me to question and take notice of the events on TV 
and in life events around on the TV, such as the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, or the rise of fascist ideology in my own country, including some of our own UK politicians and elected officials that would use bad words, racist words, to describe us immigrants, as if they were giving permission to white men to attack us. One day when I was 16 years old, walking along the high street, two middle-aged men got out of their car and they approached me. They pushed me and hurled verbal and racist physical abuse at me. They picked me up and they pushed me up against their car, but somehow I managed to get away. As I ran, they chased me in their white sports car. I ducked into an alleyway at the back of a cluster of shops. I realized I was trapped. I pounded on the back door of one of these shops and an old man stepped out. He looked at me, he turned around and shut the door. Frantic, I darted into a barber shop, hoping that they would help me. Somehow I managed to tell them what had happened. They pointed me to the phone so I could call the police. But when a voice at the other end started to question me, I found myself unable to speak. My hands shook and my voice trembled. I couldn't get out the words that I needed. A kind woman took the phone from me and explained the situation, but when the police arrived, they assumed I was the one in the wrong. I was the one that got into trouble, where I was assumed the culprit and not the victim. How was it that the people I was supposed to seek help from didn't want to help me? This made me angry. I felt hopeless. I became bitter. I developed what one might call today a chip on my shoulder. Later, my father gave me two options. He's, you know, he's still a very calm and peaceful man, a gentleman. And he said that I could either allow my anger to fester or I could get myself an education. He said I could be the first person in my family to get a degree and then I would be in a position to tackle inequality, not just for me, but also for others who have felt hopelessness in the face of injustice, much like that day when the police turned their back on me. Now, the obvious approach might have been to get into law, but I became an artist, then an art teacher, and I allowed the arts to shape my desire to work for the marginalized. I gave myself over to arts, to poetry, music, photography, spoken word, the arts of storytelling. I began to see art culture and story making, not as a tool to conquer or divide, but instead as a way to heal, to come together. I was still young though, I was around 22 years old, and in 2001, on a total whim, I moved up to Scotland. I found myself parked up in a corner of a hippie Edinburgh peace commune, just off the Royal Mile. The best, actually, it was the best hippie posh spot in town. I shared a floor of a cross splendor of European travelers, backpackers, writers, yoga teachers, hipsters, and even a mouse called Simon. I was loving it. I lived in the house of Zargonia, and we all called ourselves Zargonauts. We ate vegetarian organic food, and we hugged everyone as if we were kin from birth. People came and they went. We sat in circles, and we talked about life and meditation, being spiritually connected to the universe, and the next dance party. I worked part-time in a bar, and in my other time, I played uh, the djembe drums on the Edinburgh Royal Mile for American and Japanese tourists because they tipped, and I, used, and I paid my rent. Life was pretty good. It was amazing how personal paths and new directions, though, and world events coincide, because this was September 2001, and not only I, but the world was about to change. While living in this commune one morning, one of the American backpackers looked at me in the eye, alarmed, and he said, I think there's been an attack on my country. On the TV, we sat around and watched the Twin Towers collapse. And it's moments like that we remember forever. We remember the time of day. We remember the feeling. We even sometimes remember what the weather was like that day. Days and weeks followed that event, and I kept checking in on myself. I kept checking on things around me. Some people were doing things while other people were doing nothing. But I decided I was not ready to retreat from my world. And while the commune I lived in remained complacent, I couldn't. I decided that my world was too important. So I moved out of my bubble of comfort, and I got active. My life in Scotland was being redefined as a new Scot and as a global citizen, where every moment and every interaction, every person meant something. I did not want to see my country, the United Kingdom as a whole, or my world retreat back in terms of maybe 30 years in terms of multiculturalism, because I think that's an idea worth fighting for and worth striving for, and I was determined to make a difference. I'd now got a job in education at the big National Museum of Scotland, based in Edinburgh. 
In my first project, I wanted to respond to the event and the growing tensions that I could see. So I took out the yellow pages and I phoned every place of worship in Scotland. And six months later, after 9-11, I organized an arts festival in the Grand Hall of the National Museum of Scotland, where people of Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Christian, and Buddhist traditions stood side by side in solidarity. Musicians from diverse faith groups paid mu played music, and Coptic Christians sang songs of resurrection in Arabic. Jewish Scots performed music that combined Celtic and Klezmer tradition. They named their band Celtica Schmeltica. <laughs> 6,000 people that day came together to shape a sense of place in Scotland, to stand shoulder to shoulder at such a time of difficulty. That event was called Side by Side, a celebration of world faiths in Scotland. Now, I continued my work for the next eight years in Scotland, and around 2010, I met two older gentlemen that just so happened to be from a Rotary Club. I also found that they were ex-police officers, which, you know, so I was kind of suspect. But I let myself go, and I let them tell a story. I told them my story, at least the version I was willing to tell them at that moment. I told them about my parents, about my upbringing, about Mr. George, about my experience when I was 16. They listened with intrigue. They told me I should share my story, and they encouraged me to apply for a peace fellowship. And I did, and surprisingly, I got it. There was a group of people I discovered in the world that believed that someone from an arts background, the son of a refugee, an immigrant, that talked about why arts were important, could make a difference. Fast forward one more year, I found myself thinking about Mr. George's Prince again when I found myself leaving Scotland, leaving my job in Scotland, to become a Rotary Peace Fellow at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I more or less gave up all my possessions and packed what I could into two small suitcases, but I did pack a toothbrush. I reflected back on my parents' arrival in the UK all those years ago. They couldn't take their personal possessions with them, but they could take their objects and their mem they could take their memories, sorry, and their traditions, and they kept them alive through the stories that they passed on to me. And now I hear I was doing the same thing. At the University of North Carolina, my focus was on social justice folklore and storytelling. And after I graduated, I accepted my position here at the International Storytelling Center. But when I was about to move, actually, a, a friend, a, you know, a friend uh, based in Chapel Hill said to me, be careful, that is the Bible Belt, they're going to make you a Baptist. <laughs> well, I myself am a Sikh, so I knew my friend was joking, but I understand what, what he meant. <laughs> But during my first week here in Tennessee, I remember a man, an older gentleman, and he called out to me from across the street, Mr. Singh, Mr. Singh. So as I came, he came closer, I saw him wearing a badge that said, Son of Confederate Veterans. And I wasn't sure if that was a good sign. But I completely misjudged him, because to my surprise, the first thing he said to me as he clasped his hands together was, Namaste, Mr. Singh. Welcome to Jonesboro. He actually went on to speak some words in Hindi to me and told me how I must join him the next time he goes to the Hindu temple. And still, he's trying to get me to go to the Hindu temple, and I'm not going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few weeks later, I was here helping to host the 41st National Storytelling Festival, the festival that we produced that now draws up to 10,000 people from across this country and around the world, all who converge in Jonesboro for a long weekend of live performance storytelling. I heard some amazing stories that first weekend, and I've heard many more since. And I could clearly see that the festival, then and now, and in my work since, and what I already knew in my own heart to be true, stories help us understand one another on a human level. I got to meet and listen to some incredible people for the last five years from all over this country in the, in the job that I do. And actually right here in this region, and two years ago, Dr. Bernice King, daughter of the great civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, came and spoke at ETSU. And there was something that she said that day that stayed with me. And she said, there's one thing that Donald Trump and Black Lives Matter have in common. Both phenomenons have woken this country up to the great disparities that already exist in this nation. Regardless of your political persuasions, I see this as true. It is why what we do here at this center as why I believe stories matter, perhaps now more than ever. I'll give you another small example. A couple of years ago, I was asked to lead a workshop for a group of high school students as part of a series of events in Charleston, South Carolina, aimed at fostering dialogue and healing following the tragic racist shootings that took place when nine people's lives were taken at Mother Emanuel Church. I'm sure maybe some of you remember that. 
I started off that workshop by asking the same question I asked all of you. How many of you consider yourselves to be storytellers? Only a few hands went up. But then I asked them to think about what home meant for them, to describe their city, their lives, what matters to them. And by the end of a three-hour workshop, all of them had a story to tell. For one soft-spoken student called Chankisha Drayton, she decided to tell her story at a local storytelling event a few weeks later, and she did so, she explained, as a sort of response to the way that she sees black people portrayed in the news. She wanted to tell her own story so other people would understand her through her own words instead of somebody else's. Now, I think that's huge. It's the process of owning your own story and telling it in a way that makes sense to you rather than have somebody else tell your story for you. And that's part of the reason I wanted to share my story with you. In my work, I have seen how we can use storytelling to unravel some of the underlying societal challenges and the foundations for prejudice that remains today. How the voices of those sidelined from history refuse to conform, to be beaten down with those with power over them. How the small but powerful defined acts across time became work chants or quilt makers or folk tellers or artists that have told stories on subway trains, front porches, that have empowered and formed communities of their own, how those that managed to put ink to paper or turn paper to pulp, to those that scribed and scratched and carved story circles into rocks or circled rocks into sand, to those that turned stories from the margins of society and learned to play lead guitar in the band and gifted the world with Delta, Mississippi and Chicago blues, the slam poet, the corrido, the Appalachian ballad, the capoeira dance, the protest Sufi or Indian song. Because when we think about it, we cannot tackle racism without unpacking the legacies of slavery or oppression or our modern day institutions. When we think about it, we cannot tackle sexism without unraveling the way that gender has been told in the stories we've been told all our lives. When we think about it, we cannot tackle bigotry without looking at the stories of our historical shared and global past. And when we really think about it, we cannot tackle violations of universal human rights without listening to the stories of all those that have been stripped of their human dignity. One story from Ferguson, one story from Charleston, one story from Parkland. Pull these stories together, then collectively we shape the narrative. The narrative that builds the movement. And ultimately use story to promote the idea that telling stories matter. Where storytelling has the power and the potential to put the dream, desire and struggle of what it means to be human into words and to make a difference. One story at a time. Because when we think about it, it's an art that you don't need special equipment or costumes or anything really. Like Mr. George's story taught me as a kid in school, you don't even need a toothbrush or a cup because the world provides you with everything you need. I want to thank you all for being here today. And I want to thank you for wanting to make a difference here in Appalachia and the world. And I want to end with a poem. And this is a poem I wrote back in 2007 when I lived and worked in Glasgow, Scotland. When the mayor of Glasgow asked me to represent the city of Glasgow in a new twinning friendship program between the city of Glasgow and the, south, and the Marseille in the south of France, she, offered, she asked me to go and offer the hand of friendship on her behalf. And I, of course, I said yes. So it was an honor to represent my city. But it was on my return to the airport where I was taken for interrogation, the fourth time I'd been taken for interrogation, where I had four machine guns pointed to my head asked if I was a Muslim and if I was going to blow up the plane, and I was made to get on my knees. But this time I'm in my home city. I was on official work duty. So I asked them, and I questioned them back. I said, why are you taking me for interrogation? And the only response they could give me was I had a chip on my shoulder. And it made me think about that chip. The chip is the place that sometimes we look to to find our passions, to find the things that we care about in the world, to find our stories and where we can make a difference. So I wrote this poem, and I call it The Chip on My Shoulder. It goes like this. When they took me in for interrogation, I asked them what for. They said it was because of my chip. My chip? Well, I'm well proud of it. So I interrogated them. Let me tell you about it. This is my chip that rests on the shoulder, although sometimes it feels like a boulder, a rock, a time bomb, a ticking clock. My chip is my link to my past. It reminds me of my ancestors who fought against caste and other systems of control that puts another man down. My ancestors fought injustice against King George and his crown. To know your chip is to acknowledge a path. You expect me to bow, 
You're having a laugh. I said, go on, detain me. I refuse to fold, to be subservient, to do as I'm told. You took me in and you threatened to keep me on a nine-hour hold. For what? Is this how you want to stop war against terror? Random selection? Or is it just that my appearance is my error? Because think about it, I say. Do we really want full police state control to compromise our freedoms, to sell our soul, to just accept home office plans that tears tolerance apart, more toxic than a prime minister's fart? Not me. You may call me a soapbox preacher, I said, anti-government and into civil rights, but don't call me a Lib Dem, a Tory, or a Labour right. I'm not saying I'm better than them, because I follow my own score. I'm just a citizen who refuses to submit and actually believes in human rights law. A soppy cliche, perhaps, but we are all the seeds of one family. We all have chips on our shoulders. Discover your chip and you realise a world without borders. A chip reminds me to stand up for humanity, to be a pacifist warrior like the great Mohandas K. Gandhi. I'm proud of this chip that rests on this shoulder. It reminds me of where I'm from, to stand up to detention without cause, because think about it, it's just wrong. Namaste, and thank you all for coming. Have a good day. Thank you.